we have, as you know, it's a something. 45 minutes and then, then it is a 10 minutes break and then another 45 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very soon. much uh, for this introduction. Let me express my deepest gratitude uh, to the organizers who invited me to this marvelous event. And it's a honor to have a floor or I don't know, a screen uh, here. Uh, you know, I'm, as Alex just said, in a cold Moscow, and uh, the workshop is in Trieste, so I can imagine, uh, see uh, the sun. Uh, by the way, the sun is the subject, the topic of my today's talk. Uh, <clears throat> my plan is quite simple. First, I'll introduce a brief but I hope exciting description of the sun as a complex system. And then I'll take an advantage of this full lecture and not just 20 minute talk <clears throat> to give you an example of a solved problem, a problem of sudden desynchronization of the components of the solar magnetic field. Uh, I'll show you well, the complete way from the formulation of uh, the problem to a possible solution. So we'll discuss even some technical details. Um, I have a computer code which I cannot share in the format of the lecture because it is impossible to follow the code. But if uh, but the co the code is <clears throat> written for uh, everybody with uh, full explanation, so I can send it um, to to anybody who who is interested in <clears throat> the mathematical component deals with the uh, so called Kuramoto model of coupled oscillators, and we discuss the simplest case when there are just two differential equations, but not independent. They are coupled, and we will see what is this and how to use uh, how to use this model, this tool, these two equations. <clears throat> so the first part, uh, the sum is a complex system. You will see a lot of pictures, and so this part is, uh, I hope, is really very exciting. Um, because we, we, we can see the sun from different, you know, different points of view. First of all, uh, the first picture is the sun itself um, in different scales. So at the left, you see the sun and some black points, black areas. And I don't know, look at it as at a picture. These black areas are called sunspots. They are visible with a telescope. And these black areas, these sunspots, is an input of many, many models. Looking at them, observing them, processing them, they collect the information, and in fact, can reveal uh, a lot about the sun. But just now, using these marvelous pictures from the NASA websites, um, with both of them showed us these sunspots, okay? And you see that the sun is extremely heterogeneous. <clears throat> the sun gives us also an example of regularity breaking. Because you know, the sun, um, is rot rotating as the Earth does, but you know the period of rotation of the Earth. Okay, it's one one day, and um, you know day night day night. So we are accustomed to this rotation. At at the first sight, it is difficult to believe that the soul the sun 
exhibits differential rotation. The period of the rotation depends on the latitude. Uh, <clears throat> and we see the picture which represents different periods, as I said, depending on the latitude. The period varies from 25 to 32 days, depending on the location. And the average period, the number that you can see everywhere, it is approximately 27 days as it is observed from the Earth. <clears throat> Let us return to um, the sunspots, which will be uh, the main character of my today's presentation, and return to heterogeneity, to heterogeneous observations, because the sun is an example of heterogeneous observations. Now you see <clears throat> the sun at, I don't know, I don't remember when, and you see some black areas, and now you know that these areas represent sunspots. And, you know, some of them are clustered. Scientists um, call each cluster as a group of sunspots or sunspot group. And you see two sunspot groups in this picture, but two, uh, not two, probably three to four weeks later, the sun is a little bit different. The activity increases, and as a result, the number of the groups, not two, but four now, and you see that these black areas are larger than at the left. <clears throat> and these areas, these sunspots, generate a solar index index of solar activity in early days called the Wolf number after Wolf who proposed this index. It is computed, it is defined as the number of groups for the right multiplied by 10 plus the number of sunspots and multiplied by a specific coefficient so-called observer coefficient. We will look at this proxy at Wolf numbers uh, as a proxy to solar activity uh, many times during <clears throat> today's lecture. Um, by the way, the name, which was the Wolf numbers, uh, changed and now uh, scientists address to it as international sunspot numbers, ISSN. This notation will appear later. But <clears throat> now let me give a historical note. Uh, it was Ludovic XIV, uh, the Sun King, uh, Rue de Soleil, who declared to observe sunspots. And you know what happened at the time? Uh, almost immediately after the Sun King, do not forget the Sun King, declared to observe them, they disappeared. They disappeared. And the Poch called the Mounder Minimum or Mounder Pose started. It's really very interesting <clears throat> that at some moment, solar activity was very, very small. It lasted for almost 100 years. And to see it, you have to look at this graph, <clears throat> uh, uh, in this graph at the red curve, which is almost invisible because it almost coincides with the horizontal axis. This is the level of activity. So it dropped in the beginning of 70s century, almost to zero. <clears throat> and uh, some values were recovered only in, uh, the, in the end of the century. 
<clears throat> you can say, well, it's it was caused because nobody observed. Okay, even despite the king declared observed. But it is not the case because there, are, there were observations <clears throat> and um, the number of observations is shown as a background. So we see that people, a lot of people, here is a number of observations that was made that is in blue. <clears throat> and despite these observations, nothing, almost nothing was observed. So you can look at the sun as an example of numerous observations. <clears throat> the sun is an example of cyclicity. And you know, it's not just a picture of a butterfly. This is uh, another thing. Each vertical uh, line represents a lot of dots. And these dots are observed sunspots. Sunspots observed along, uh, <clears throat> this is a misprint, along the longitude. longitude. Uh, <clears throat> so the vertical, the vertical axis represents the location along the longitude. And for example, at the very, le at the very left, um, the sunspots were observed, well, somewhere in the middle, uh, middle latitudes. Uh, here, I hope that my mouse is visible. The sunspots were observed close to the equator. Uh, at some time, because the horizontal axis represents time, so sometime, as for instance, I don't know, uh, for instance, here, where is my mouse, um, <clears throat> the sunspots were observed in or let me say like this. So let me collect main irregularities of this picture. Well, first of all, it is Sasha, you know, <clears throat> we have a problem with uh, uh, your lecture because it uh, uh, interrupts. Uh, maybe <clears throat> you have a, a low internet activity right now at your place, but is it possible to switch off your video? Now you are muted please unmute yes but still i have a problem i don't hear you i don't know others could you write in the chat do you hear professor uh, uh okay now unmute please yourself I'm sorry for this. Yes, now it's okay, fine. I'm, it's very strange because I, I understood the problem, but all the time, well, okay. The connection is nice. Yeah, yes, but anyway, anyway, anyway now follow. it's fine. Yes, now <clears throat> it's fine. Let's, let's follow. So I'm, I, uh, let me share the screen. Wait for a moment. I'll have a look at chat. Uh, one one moment. Um, so my plan is to start with this slide. So let me go backward. Uh, I previously I discussed this picture and try to say that the sun is an example of numerous observations, and I stress your attention on the mounder pose when <clears throat> the sunspots was almost absent. And it is shown by the red curve. And now I'm going to show you, to propose you to look at the sun as an example of cyclicity. Uh, what is 
here. The horizontal axis is time. The vertical axis is the location of sunspots at a given day along <coughs> the longitude. This is a misprint. It is not a latitude. It must be longitude. Uh, and you see that at different time moments, sunspots are located at different latitudes. For example, they are never or almost never located at high latitudes, close to the poles. Then you see the equator world drift of sunspots as the cycle proceeds. Uh, let me recall that from the left to the right, the time goes on. And you see the shift, this equator world, equator world shift from left to right. You also see that, well, at the first sight, that the picture is symmetrical with respect to the solar equator. But sometimes, for example, here, where my mouse is, you see a clear asymmetry. So we could expect the symmetry with respect to the equator. Still, uh, the astrophysicist is interested in symmetry breaking. The goal is to explain why the symmetry is broken from time to time. <clears throat> and we will return to, uh, well, recent, let me say, recent episode of asymmetry, which happened in 1960s till 1970s in so called 20th cycle. <clears throat> And interestingly, that frequently at solar minima, the sunspots of both cycles are visible. Solar minima means that the solar activity is in its minimum. And during the minima, the sunspots of both cycles are visible. Sports of a new cycle appear uh, far from the equator, like here. And at the same time, you see the sunspots close to the equator, and they are the sunspots of uh, the ending cycle. <clears throat> and well, you can guess the name of this picture. It is called butterfly diagram because it's, it reminds us a butterfly. <clears throat> I talked about cyclicity. And you see, okay, this quasi cycle from minima to minima, from minima to minima. And it's approximately 11 years. It's called solar cycle. It lasts approximately 11 years. And this is, let me say, the main regularity <clears throat> of solar activity. But because of change of polarity, the magnetic cycle consists of two sequential solar cycles. And that is why uh, we have another regularity uh, related to the solar magnetic field, which is approximately two solar cycles or 22 years. It is called Hail cycle. <clears throat> So let's return to Wolf numbers that were uh, well, improved, let me say like this, uh, by uh, uh, different teams. And now they are called international sunspot numbers. Uh, they are observed daily uh, from more than 100 years, from 1870, uh, we have regular observations without gaps. Uh, as you remember, um, these observations started at the time of Ludovic, uh, of Louis um, 14. 
And from 1870, we have daily observation without gaps. And you see these daily observations, a number of cycles, and you can guess where, um, where are minima and maxima. And we can uh, smooth the data with four year moving window. And then you see a wave. And it's a good question uh, how similar this wave to a sine wave. And we will return to this question later. <clears throat> and 11 cycle is 11 year cycle is quite visible. But let me stress that it's not a cycle, it's not ex exact regularity, it's quasi regularity, it's quasi cycle because the period in quotes and amplitude were vary from cycle to cycle. <clears throat> And you can even see that uh, from the beginning of the 20th century, um, the cycles are in general larger. So we see a long wave. And this is indeed another regularity <clears throat> called uh, Gleisberg cycle, cycle that lasts, uh, well, it's called secular cycle. Uh, the length is not extremely clear. It's like four sequential solar cycles. So up to well, eight multiplied by 11 is 88. So it's up to 100 years. <clears throat> now we can look <clears throat> at solar cycle and other cycles with different scale. Now you see um, you see the observations, the proxy of solar activity, another proxy group number. And I explained what is the group of sunspots. And you see this index from uh, the time of <clears throat> Louis XIV. And here, uh, in addition to the solar cycle, which is clearly observed, we see the mounder minimum or the mounder pose at the left. Another minimum, not so strong, which is called Dalton minimum. And you can guess this large circular wave. And this minimum is a part of this wave, which is, so this, this minimum is extremely deep, <clears throat> but you can believe in this large, wave of approximately 100 years called Gleisberg, Gleisberg cycle. <clears throat> if you look further at the past, you can see even larger cycles. We know cycles, quasi cycles that last for millennium, cycles that last for approximately 2000 years called Holstadt cycle. <clears throat> and you see that it looks like you have periods, the periods are doubled from 11 to 24, 22 years, from 22 to 88, eight cycles in a row, from 1,000 years to 2,000 years. And you know that this is a trace of low dimensional chaos. So you can Treat the sun as an example of a low dimensional chaos. <clears throat> it's not a single trace, which I just shown you. There are many related to um, well-known characteristics of chaotic systems, like Lapunov exponent or um, <clears throat> fractal dimension of uh, related, uh, re related uh, proxies. But just to give you um, an intuition, I show this simple picture and I'm not going to go beyond them. <clears throat> um, again, just to give you an example of synchronization, which is observed with solar proxies, 
And now you can look at the sun uh, as a system with <clears throat> uh, to the sun as an example of synchronization, I presented <clears throat> a lot of different time series related to solar activity, and I'm not going to quantify them right now. But you see one, two, three, five different series. They are, their definition are absolutely different. But because they are related to the sun, they are related to one another and they follow one another. You see <clears throat> almost, well, you see very similar pattern exhibited by each of these series. So the sun is an example of synchronization. Now I'm going to say that the sun is an example of desynchronization. And as a first sight, well, it, it looks, that I'm cheating because <clears throat> these two series are nicely synchronized. You see almost exact anticorrelation, almost exact anticorrelation. So you look, it's you know almost as if it were a mirror between two series at the scale which is presented. But if we change the scale, if you consider the scale of several years, you can see, and I will show where, these two nicely synchronized proxies suddenly exhibited desynchronization. For example, uh, last, uh, last points at the very right, you see that the both curves um, <clears throat> goes downward, go to the same direction. And this is not, um, this is not a single anomaly. Uh, let's look at um, the minima of the lower curve and the oscillation around some level between 1970 and um, almost 1980, where this anticorrelation suddenly uh, disappeared. And <clears throat> as a result, you see the change in the scale. Okay, you see that even nicely synchronized series. Uh, could lose the synchronization. You see the, an example of sudden desynchronization, uh, example of anomalies that have to be explained and understood, right? <clears throat> the sun is an example of various predictions. And this is very interesting and exciting and intriguing picture. Well, if you know a lot about a system, you could try to predict its future. It's very interesting if you think about the sun. Uh, re regarding the solar cycle, uh, you could try to predict the time of the next solar maximum and the amplitude at the maximum. This picture gives, summarizes a lot of predictions of the maximal amplitude of the previous cycle, cycle 24. Now we are in cycle 25. <clears throat> mm, the predictions, are summarized according to their masses. So each rectangle represents a range of predictions, roughly speaking, done with the same method. And <clears throat> black dots show you the average obtained with each method. Uh, <clears throat> 
the area shows uh, the variation of the prediction, the variation of this black dot, if you like, if you allow me such speaking. Uh, the black dashed line is the global average, the average of all these predictions. The blue line is the real value. And you see that the majority of predictions are larger <coughs> than the true value. So we can conclude that even despite the scientists know a lot about the sun and are rather successful in understanding the solar dynamo mechanism, we have a lot of work. So we should not avoid working with the solar data because everything is known. No, not everything. Our predictions can be significantly improved. <clears throat> to conclude this part, I would say that the sun is a simple natural example of a complex system with continuous development of knowledge, huge data volume, non-linear modeling, and non-trivial prediction. <clears throat> well, the part with a lot of pictures is over. And now I am going to introduce an example of an inverse problem when we will try to identify of episodes of desynchronization. <clears throat> to start, I recall you the butterfly diagram. And uh, you remember this marvelous story about down about equator equator world drift of sunspots as solar cycles proceed. And now let's think about some explanation about physical mechanism that stays that underlies this drift. <clears throat> First of all, we can think that there are different components of solar magnetic field. There is so-called toroidal component of the solar magnetic field related to the equator. There is a poloidal component related to the poles. And magnetic field performs a transformation from, <clears throat> uh, I answer uh, in, 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 a bit later if you don't mind. Uh, <clears throat> and so the last, the minimum was okay. So the, there is a question, um, you, you said, okay, you said amplitude vary from cycle to cycle, which is very clear. Can we also, call that solar activity level. I'm not sure that I understand this question. I think that during the question and answer session, you'd better, uh, you'd better explain it a bit more. Uh, but the last, the minimum was in the beginning of 2009. And it's, it's, it's regarding your second question in, in the chat. So let me now return to toroidal and poloidal components of the solar magnetic field <clears throat> and describe very roughly, very, very roughly, the transformation between them, how magnetic field transforms from toroidal magnetic field to poloidal and then backward. 
you can think about a flow, uh, a flow which is sketched in white uh, in this figure. So it's done with my hand, okay, with my pen. <clears throat> and um, this, you know, brief and rough uh, presentation to some extent correct. Indeed, uh, the transformation from toroidal to poloidal components uh, is performed in the, the solar surface, okay? And the backward transformation happens in a deeper, in deeper layers of the sun. Um, recently, uh, some observations um, with satellites become possible. And we know the speed, um, we better know the speed in the upper layers than in deeper layers of the sun, but still there are estimates of books. <clears throat> and um, this part of the, of, of, of the flow um, is characterized by larger speed. And um, the motion is very, very slow in deeper layers. In what follows, we will need proxies to both components of the solar magnetic field. And we have them. One of the proxies is sunspot numbers, Wolf numbers, international sunspot numbers. So the series I have already shown. The second proxy is called magnetic AA index, and it corresponds to the poloidal component. <clears throat> what is important, um, now we see the picture, the graph of the two proxies uh, where sunspot numbers, ISSN, is in, in red and the second index is in blue. Um, these two smoothed indices are um, exhibit a phase shift almost everywhere. So we see that the blue curve go a little bit ahead. Not everywhere. You see clear exception at the beginning, at the very beginning. Then, <clears throat> but probably it's relatively um, short period of time, but still. Uh, then uh, at the second full maximum, and uh, this phase of synchronization lasts probably for a cycle up to the next, almost to the next maximum. And then, then blue curve goes ahead. And in the 1960s, you see another moment first of the synchronization um, of the boats indices and then even a disaster because the blue curve for, for a moment stopped follow a solar cycle. So let me repeat. The red curve, which is quite smooth, follow the solar cycle everywhere. It's not surprising because this is a proxy to solar activity. And you see this wave everywhere. It's not the case for geomagnetic index in the 1960s, because you see, this is <clears throat> uh, a wave, then it goes down, then up. And instead of going down it, after, you know, after a, a short stop, it continues upward moving. Uh, so something happened 
during the 20th cycle, during the 1960s. And it is, you know, you can see it with a naked eye and uh, there was and probably still is a discussion what happened at that time. <clears throat> and let me stress your attention that nowadays you do not see something like 100 years ago, something like in the beginning of the 20th century or in the 1960s. I need a minute or two <clears throat> to pose the problem and then we'll make, uh, we'll make a break, 10 minute break. Uh, what I'm going to show you is a story about the period of solar cycle. Uh, we understood uh, it's clear that it varies from cycle to cycle. We can, we can, and probably this is um, another attempt to answer the question, uh, the question uh, from the chat. We can give a value, we can compute the period. We can compute the instantaneous period of solar cycle using Fourier transform. I'll postpone details to the second part, how to compute. So let's assume that we are able to perform the computation and the instantaneous period computed with ISSN is in orange, with AA in blue, and <clears throat> the average, let's also postpone what doesn't mean the average in green. And you see the oscillation around 11 years, which is expected because the period is approximately 11 years. But then you see at least two exceptions. In the beginning of the century, in the 1970s, it's a peak. So in the 1960s and 1970s, okay? And at the very end. The, at the very end, which corresponds to nowadays. And let me recall that with this graph, we see nothing interesting uh, at the right. And the main question is, will anomalous growth in the instantaneous period results in desynchronization of toroidal and poloidal components of the solar magnetic field? I am going to start uh, my second part exactly with the slide. And probably first of all, I answer questions. And now, Alec, my part, my 45 minutes are over. Yes, fine. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, yeah, Alexander. It was actually is a uh, fantastic, yeah. Uh, knowledge at least it's for me about this synchronization and disorganization it's, uh, it's uh, indeed a way we are talking about the complex earth but sun i think it uh, will give us a more and more surprises with time of the gathering information and data from this and indeed there is the utilization of this data and analysis of this data uh, and uh, understanding through the inverse problem it's uh, very important Thank you very much. Now, 10 minutes break, <clears throat> and uh, then we will.